The Paul Leslie Hour, helping people tell their stories. And now your host, Paul Leslie. Hey, it's me. You're tuned into the Paul Leslie Hour, episode number fourteen, and I'm interviewing chosen Jack Hobner. I'm saying that correctly, right? Yeah, that sounds good enough. <laughs> and he's the author of Single White Monk: Tales of Death, Failure, and Bad Sex. Although not necessarily in that order, <laughs> and he's a monk and writer, so I have to ask you: You're a monk and writer, but in what order? Oh, that's a really good question. Can they be on the same line? Sure. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm no longer practicing full time at a at a Zen center or a monastery as a monk, and I'm doing more writing now. But being a monk is sort of the Foundation that I that I write from and that I try and live my life from. So I don't know that there is an order. It's a good question, though. It's kind of kind of a con. Hmm. What does writing feel like to you? Uh, heaven and sometimes and hell and other times. Um, a journey, a, a journey, a challenge, a calling, and a curse. <laughs> Why do you do it? That's a good question. I started when I was probably 16. I, I decided I wanted to be a writer, or, or, or decided that I, kn- I knew that that was something that was something that was in me found a, found its completion through writing. And all the different phases I've had, you know, I, I was in college studying philosophy, and then when I moved to Los Angeles to study uh, to to work in Hollywood and try and write screenplays, and then when I left that for the monastery, the through line was always this almost intuition or instinct or urge to get things down on paper. Yeah, it, it's uh, somewhere in between like an urge and a calling, I guess. Hmm. And you come from, it's a Catholic family. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. My, um, well, my mom, my mom is Catholic. My, my dad, not so much, but I was raised in a pretty Catholic environment. What would you say that it was? that kind of led you on the the spiritual track that you're on? That's a good question. I mean, I, uh, you know, I studied, like I said, I studied philosophy in college because I was looking for some answers. And at the time, I sort of posed the philosophy, philosophy major to myself as I was, I needed something to write about. Um, and I, I think there's some truth to that. I, I wanted a foundation for my writing i wanted something to say and and also i wanted to find a way to live i mean that's the that's probably the most stripped down honest answer i can give is that i wanted a way to live and when i finally met my mentor who was a zen buddhist monk from new jersey he kind of showed me an example of someone who was was wise was on a on a wise path and i hadn't seen that i mean when i studied philosophy in college it was just a lot of professors with a lot of information and a lot of knowledge and and some of them were quite impressive, but I didn't find from any of them a, a way to live. And, and of course, a lot of it was my own mindset at the time. I was kind of shopping around for for a philosophy or or a, or a philosophical system to kind of serve as the the software to plug into my hardware, and that that didn't quite work. So. Then I just thought, okay, I'll come to Hollywood and, and find myself through independent filmmaking and, and um, creating arts, basically expressing myself. And that didn't work either. And so when I met my mentor, I, I saw a deeper way to live. And there was a, a principle behind it that his teacher had taught him. And that principle was alive in, in my mentor. And that, that was really appealing to me. And how would you describe this way to live? Well, at being in the present moment is kind of the contemporary parlance for it. I was taught as a monk to give yourself completely to whatever you're doing. It's very simple. My my teacher was a very old Rinzai Zen master from Japan. Used to talk about how you have to. He, he said Zen Zen has few moving parts. That it's it's simple, but it's not easy. So you. We, we tend to get caught in our heads. And that was a big one for me. I can't even overstate that. I was 
always thinking, always kind of trapped in my head. And the Zen path called Tathagata Zen was the kind of Zen that my teacher taught. The Zen path really challenged the ground I was standing on when I was trapped in my head. And, and it helped to point out how that self that I think is in my head, that voice, it's not fundamentally or ultimately there. But that sense of self, what they call the conditional self in Buddhism, it co it co-arises with this environment. So in order to have a healthy self, you have to make relationship with your environment instead of doubling back like the snake swallowing its own tail and overthinking things or, or, or thinking too selfishly or thinking selfishly at all. Rather, the path is to give yourself, your body and mind, the word in Japanese is taitoku, which means a single, uh, which means um, uh, to apprehend with your whole body. So it's a lot of fancy Buddhist words and, and basically just amounting to giving yourself to whatever activity you're doing in that moment. And, and when you do that, that thinking mind dissolves into the activity and you lose yourself. And that's a big moment. One of the reasons I love writing so much is because I'm able to just completely lose myself in it for hours and hours, and, and I'm able to, to devote, devote myself to it and focus on it and have a sense of, of purpose and, and momentum. But the Zen path teaches, okay, guess what? You can't be writing all the time. You're going to miss you're going to miss your life if you do that. So you need to give yourself to the dishes when you're washing to them or you're a phone call or a podcast or, or even just walking down the street. I was just taking, I was late for this interview. And so I was walking back from a restaurant and it's, I'm in Los Angeles right now passing through and it's um, insanely, it's, it's uh, been a hundred degrees the last few days. I mean, we're in middle October, but it's been very hot. So I was walking down the street and was annoyed by the heat and embarrassed that I was late for the call and caught in my head. So, I had to return to the practice in that moment and, and practice is, okay, you're walking down the street. So walk down the street, put your attention and focus into this walking and you don't want to feel the heat, but go ahead and feel your sweaty armpits, and go into your senses and, and make it walking meditation as you go home. And, and when you do that, again, the thinking mind, it dissolves into this giving, this, this relationship with your surroundings. Uh, yeah. Hmm. Well, I think what you were talking about when you were when you were saying that you know you you couldn't stop you couldn't stop thinking you know, you were always in your head. That's probably resonating with lots of people who are listening. Why do we do that? I you know is that the important question? <laughs> <laughs> it's certainly a good one. You know, in Buddhism, it's subtle, but boy, is it helpful to pay attention to the point or aim of a practice like Zen. And Buddhism tells us, you know, the, uh, the problem is suffering. The problem is suffering. The, the, the first noble truth is life is dukkha. Dukkha is a Sanskrit word, and that means disaffection or, or a, a lack of completion. It's often translated as suffering, but that's a slightly awkward translation. But you, you could say that there's this quality of unsatisfactoriness to life. Mm -hmm. And that's the important, yeah, that's the important thing to remember. So the Buddha, whenever he was asked sort of hypothetical questions or philosophical questions or speculative questions, he would, he would sort of give the, you know, the, 1600 years ago, uh, ancient Indian version of, of the answer of that's, that's above my pay grade. <laughs> you would say, let's return to the main point. Life, life is suffering. How do, how do we deal with that? And, and then we, and then we go from there. there. There's a great story in Buddhism about how someone was asking him a speculative question, you know, why do we suffer? Or is, is there life after death or is there a God or something like that? And he said, you know, imagine you, you're on a battlefield and you get shot with an arrow you don't start asking, what's the 
make and model of this arrow? And what was the arrowhead made out of? Was it steel or was it bone? Or were, were these feathers plastic? Or you know, what 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 grade is the wood of the of the shaft? He says you you, you want to get help for your problem. He said a spiritual practice should be the same way. It's about alleviating suffering, not answering speculative questions. Now I'm going to answer your speculative question after that. <laughs> I, I don't know what the answer is. There's a lot of great stuff being done now in neurology and the crossover between neurology and meditation and evolutionary biology. And, you know, some of the scientists have some interesting points to make, one of which is, you know, we're highly, highly evolved creatures. It's not a mistake that we think so much. So it's not a problem. Our brains are working for us. They're working overtime for us. So we're carrying billions and billions and billions of years of, of evolution inside or between our ears. So we got a workhorse in there. And it's, you know, we've got the reptilian part of the brain and we've got the logical part of the brain. We've got this in, miraculous functioning between our ears and behind our eyes. And it's trying to protect us. It's trying to ward off the saber-toothed tiger, <laughs> only there are no saber-toothed tigers anymore. So, so it's inducing anxiety, and where in the past it probably would have been keeping us alert to danger. So I, I, I think we have to work with, with, our, with ourselves and our minds instead of working against. So meditation and, and practice, spiritual practice is often dis- described as a, it's a focused and serious, but also a gentle and, and non-judgmental practice. Because you can't fight your brain. I mean, it's way older than you, and there's stuff going on inside there that's going on for a reason. The, the point is to, 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 to work with what you've got to alleviate your suffering and to, and to help people around you who are suffering. And I feel like that's the point of human life in a nutshell. Hmm. You've written this book, Single White Monk, and I'm curious... It's been said by a lot of people who have read your book that one of the things they like about your 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 writing is that you don't try to present this uh, resume version of yourself, which is what a lot of writers do. Yeah. So, yeah. how important is it for you when you're writing to tell the truth? It's of utmost importance. I mean, it's different... Yeah, I'm trying to find the truth when I'm writing. And, and a lot of times I, I'm able to look at my practice and at my life in an unvarnished way but when I, when I can see it on the page. And I share these things in my writing because I think it's important. I mean, you hit the nail on the head. There's so many spiritual writers who are presenting the resume version of themselves or, or presenting the best that their tradition has to offer, but but it's the worst within us that we access these traditions to to address. And I feel like when I'm reading, I like to, whether it's literature or, or even spiritual texts, but I tend to turn more towards literature for this. Maybe somebody like Dostoevsky is the best example. You know, most people are struggling, and watching someone work through a struggle is oftentimes far more instructive than having them give you the lessons that they garnered from that struggle afterwards. As a, as a reader, it really pulls you in. You can see yourself in the character. Whereas if you're just getting a, a lecture, you feel always feel a little bit inadequate on some level. Like this person who's this great spiritual teacher, has something to offer, and I'm never going to quite get there. But this person is pretty great, and this tradition is pretty great. I'm trying to sort of worm, uh, show people, worm the insights into people f- through telling my own my own stories and sh- sharing my own struggles. That, and, and beyond that, I'm not quite sure why. Just, that just seems to be the writing that, that works for me. I like it when it's honest and real, but whether I'm reading it or trying to write it. Was there anything in this book that you almost hesitated to put in? <laughs> Every page. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, a lot of times I, yeah, I mean, especially the second part of the book where I talk about the scandal around my teacher, a sex scandal that was, was so difficult for our community. You know, it's easy to write 
I mean, I write, you know, I, I live in a community and I write this, I write these stories about living in that community and I've tended to keep the stories focused on myself because it's a lot harder on a lot of different levels to, to write honestly about other people. Um, it just almost isn't my place. So I try and keep the focus on myself mostly. The hard stuff to write is stuff where my experiences overlap with, with other people. And now I, that, that's the hardest stuff. And that's the stuff where I hesitate because I'm pretty crazy ambitious as a writer, but I, there's a, there's a line where it's not worth crossing. And I don't want, I don't want to ever hurt anybody ever through my writing. And hurt is a specific word. And I had to think about this for a long time when I was working on this book, especially the second part. And the conclusion that I came to that it just kind of popped in my head one day was that I don't mind upsetting people. I don't want to hurt anybody, but I don't, I don't mind upsetting people. So people will get upset sometimes. And, and if I'm telling the truth and throwing myself under the bus first and foremost, that's, that's the best I can do. What misconceptions do you think that there are about you? Oh, uh, I don't know. I don't even know what, what, if there's any conceptions. I don't know if I'm, I'm that important, important to merit misconceptions. I think totally honest. But you caught me off guard. I'm not sure how to answer that. Well, let me put it a different way. Being on the, the pursuit that you're on or, uh, the path that you're on, what misconceptions do you think there are about Buddhist monks? Okay, that's a good one. People are absolutely enamored with the perception of monks being pure, pristine in their behavior. And that's something from the start that I, I've had a problem with. And one of the reasons I like Zen practice is that it, it, it never presents itself. Zen, Zen, Zen masters rarely, if ever, present themselves as saints. You know, and, and this is, gets really tricky because I think when people see someone who's devoting themselves to spiritual work, the practice works. And, I mean, you, you must know this. You, your listeners must know this, except for sort of the hardcore, maybe new atheists in the in the crowd. When we're around spiritually developed people, people who've done a lot of meditation, people who have had some deep insights, people who are moving along a path towards compassion and egolessness. There's a kind of purity to them. You can feel it. They're open and they respond to the moment with their complete attention, like a, like a kid almost. And that can be quite beautiful. People mistake that for purity of behavior. So then if they see that teacher having a glass of sake you know they feel all disillusioned so buddhism in general but specifically the zen path it's never been about a path of of being a saint for me or for the people that i really respect um it's more about living as br bravely and openly and with curiosity in the exact present moment now as you can but people like to they need mar they they like to have i don't know they it's so instantly they dump a bunch of preconceptions on you about how you should behave how you should respond to them how you should speak and and i love to sort of poking pins in those balloons those inflated perceptions that they have because again, you know, a lot of times people have these preconceptions, you know, for a variety of reasons, but I've, I've always, in my writing, trying to break down the distance between the lay person and the monk, because we all have a responsibility to live as presently, uh, in the present moment as authentically and, and, and compassionately as possible. It's not just the province of, of ordained people or monks. People want you to be a saint so that they can kind of get their hit when they're in your presence and then go off and do whatever they want in their own lives. I mean, I'm the same way. But, but we do have this responsibility, especially now on this planet. We're all coming together a lot more closely, and the environment is in trouble, and there are deadly weapons that countries are aiming at each other. I mean, we, we all have this responsibility to 
wake up. There have been many people that I've known, who, me included, who they begin meditating and many things in their life improve. Just many different things. You know, the, their, their ability to sleep, their response to other people, their temperament, and then they stop for seemingly no reason. Why do you think so many people, they improve and then they kind of back off of it? I think because the the effects on your personal self and maybe your professional life, your sleep, as you said, your level of insights, it can shoot up pretty dramatically when you when you start meditating and you focus on it. It's a it's an incredible tool for self improvement. Okay. Right. And you know, yeah, and, and everywhere from Silicon Valley to Washington D.C. to Hollywood is is discovering this. That's why mindfulness is so popular now. So it's an it's a it is an unbeatable self improvement technique. The problem is, the problem is, it's 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 tricky, but the that's not the that's not the purpose of of meditation ultimately and i think hmm. i think people people start to think they they feel a little bit better and so maybe they stop doing it you know generally speaking people return to the practice when they're suffering when there's trouble when there's a problem and when you're not feeling that internal tension it's harder to rally so my feeling is the second part of your practice is you don't do it for yourself anymore. You start doing it for for others and for the world around you. Like you have to step away from self improvement and into compassion and ex- extending your grace, as it were, that your merit that you accumulate into the world around you. And that's when you really start to grow. Otherwise, you're just doing maintenance on yourself. It's just self improvement and. That path, I think, it's, we, you know, it's called the Hinayana path. And there's two paths, the lesser vehicle and the greater vehicle. The lesser vehicle is Hinayana. And you're kind of doing it for yourself in Hinayana. And I think it's hard, it's like, it's hard, it's hard to stay motivated for that. Because the practice naturally leads you to the Mahayana path, which is the path of compassion, which is the path of being a bodhisattva or, or someone who's of, of help to others. And it sounds kind of boring on the surface, like you're a, hang dog mother who's chasing after her kids cleaning up after them or something but and in fact i think it's you know there's a great quote by joseph campbell a vital person vitalizes when a spiritually evolved person walks into a room and starts interacting with people his or her words and gestures and presence have kind of a healing and invigorating effect on people uh, but th- and that and that's and then you begin to feel of service and you begin to feel like you have some some purpose and a place in this world and that that's the real path of practice, I think. And that's why I think so much of the modern mindfulness movement, the mic mindfulness they call it, is problematic because it doesn't it you know, if you're if you're at Google in the deep mind AI research department and you're working sixteen hours a day, six days a week, and your project manager brings in a meditation teacher to help alleviate you of your stress, you know, that's not the best use of of mindfulness meditation uh, just you know for example take care of your worker bees so that they can be better worker bees you know the real path is moving out of your own suffering and becoming a an invigorating and a healing presence for the people around you and not in any big special and important way maybe you're just paying more attention to the checkout clerk at trader joe's you know and you find yourself saying something to reach into that person and leave a bit of yourself there in a good way. Maybe it's just you do that for the rest of your life as much as you possibly can. You don't all have to sort of have a massive meditation community like Thich Nhat Hanh and, and, or, or, or be some kind of spiritual martyr of some kind. I mean, it's a lot of these small moments of you in the world manifesting your true self that, that saves the world and, and invigorates it. With your books, is there anything that you, more than anything else, hope or wish for the reader to get? I feel like there's a great conversation out there somewhere. I don't know if it was recorded or written down, but but the novelist 
David Foster Wallace was talking with um, Jonathan Franz and his friend, two of them, of course, being like the greatest novelists of, of my generation, at least David Foster Wallace, anyways. And, you know, they talked about what the point of literature is. And they both concluded, and this really propelled them on their careers, I think, that the job of, of literature, of writing, is to make people feel less alone, to give them a friend on the page. So when I'm putting stuff down, I just hope there's somebody out there that's a little bit confused, stressed, and anxious. If they pick up my book and they read it, there's a sense of relief and hope. So I try and get people to laugh, first of all, at my problems, at my idiocy, at my clowning, through my clowning my way through my practice. And that loosens them up. And then I always have an insight at the end of a story that that hopefully sinks in through all the looseness in their mind and body that laughing provides. Hopefully the insight can slip in. And, and I don't necessarily care if they get anything out of the insight, but I, what I hope they get out of it is that keep working through your struggles and, and, and insights and change and transformation will, will come to you. Nothing stays the same. You know, I usually start off my my pieces, my essays with a kind of a problem of some kind and a crisis and then and then a resolution so that there's hope to keep going. So, so I hope that's what people get. I hope they, it helps them hit the reset buttons in their own lives and their own practice and provide them a little company, a, a little companionship in that process. One of the themes that I, I noticed again and again in Single White Monk, your book, was in various ways dealing with disappointment and I wanted to know when someone feels like they are a disappointment or they feel disappointed what do you think the best the best response to that is well hopefully like you said they're feeling it mm -hmm. you know that's the important thing because usually what's happening is people are constructing a story instantly either about how bad they are or about how they're going to change themselves and be good. I mean, usually we're not feeling the disappointment. And that's, that's an important distinction. Usually we're, we're scrambling away from it. A disappointment is an interesting thing because if you really sit with it and are aware of, of its presence, say if you're meditating, you know, it's a call, it's a call for something else. It's a call for something greater. It's a call for change. There's potentially an opportunity in there. But it's usually going to require some, some humbleness. So that's why I think it's important to, to feel it, to actually feel disappointed. I mean, it, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a failure to feel disappointment. And in fact, uh, until you feel it, I don't think anything can change. And you can't be honest with yourself about why you're disappointed. And you can't honestly examine your expectations. Maybe, maybe there's some part of you that's holding on to the past. And that part of you needs to let go and disappear into the, you know, into, into your youth where it belongs. You know, a lot of us are disappointed because we have these youthful expectations that we haven't outgrown. You know, so there's a real wisdom and a real humility and, uh, that can come from just letting yourself feel the disappointment, having a good cry, talking it out with someone, and then examining your expectations for life, and then and then maybe charting a more focused and serious path for what you want out of the future instead of lingering on the, the path. I mean, I have, I have a line in the book. I hope I can remember it. Regret is the mistake of pl applying the wisdom that comes with age to the past instead of the future. I mean, I, I think that's true. You know, if you just become conscious of this little demon and disappointment inside you that's pulling you backwards and re retool your expectations, you can be reborn so to speak. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. You know, it occurs to me that so much of social media, so much of the current popular culture, maybe it always was this way, I'm not sure, but is about being 
a somebody, so to speak. You know, it's like absolutely. Well, our culture has changed. I mean, I'm 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 doing this sort of this book tour thing, which is basically me playing to empty seats in bookstores. But <laughs> speaking of disappointment and recooling expectations. So I'm staying with my sister. I'm, I'm in Hollywood, and my sister works at uh, on a TV show, and and she she works in the writers' room, and she's working on a script right now with the writers. It's kind of very exciting. She's very fun, and it's just kind of fun. She's actually living in my old apartment. I, I mean, I, I I I moved out of this apartment many years ago, but I I come back and forth, and I'm still on the lease and and everything. But so she's living here now. So I'm sitting in this old apartment, and I'm remembering my days in Hollywood, and so much has changed since then. So much has become accelerated in terms of of the proliferation of images, the amounts of of data that we consume daily. It's absolutely mind boggling. So she's working on this TV show with a bunch of young people because it's set in college, and there's this new kind of celebrity that's appearing. I mean. You know, the Kardashians were an example of celebrities that are famous just kind of for being famous. Now there's even a permutation beyond that where you've got these kids. I mean, one of the kids she's working with on the show is a young, I don't know what he is, but he's darn famous and he's darn rich. <laughs> he's got a house in Brooklyn and a house here in Los Angeles, and he's kind of a designer of fashion clothing, and he's kind of a model, and he's kind of an actor, but basically what he calls himself is is an influencer okay he's a, he's like an influencer so there's this new this is this you know it's like a fractal pattern you've got this basic initial dna of fame and it just keeps growing and replicating and replicating and spawning and fractaling out into ever greater permutations so now you've got these people that are famous just really for where you know being good looking being in the right place at the right time having a very savvy social media presence, and then just kind of their life is their brand. So bring me back to your original question, actually, around this, because I have – being somebody, being some, being somebody. So, yeah, yeah, we're – everybody wants to be somebody, and, and rich, independent, and famous <laughs> seems to be the American thing, or, or be somebody else. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, just about everybody now. I mean, you know, even my dad is on Facebook. I mean, I, I, I think there's something maybe I mean, I, we're getting close to a third of the planet being on Facebook. I mean, which is pretty astonishing. The the only other institution that can boost those numbers worldwide is Christianity. So think about that. Wow. You know, and what is Facebook? It's yeah. What is Facebook? You're presenting an image of yourself. You're you're presenting. I mean, I told you right now, I'm, I'm playing to a lot of empty rooms at these bookstores. But if you look at my Facebook page, it's like, it's like this guy's on his way to the Nobel Prize, you know? Because <laughs> you don't, you don't, you don't post the depressing stuff. I mean, that that would be somehow that doesn't work in that medium, you know? So we're in interesting times, and it's we're we're in very interesting times. Yeah. What case would you make for being nobody? <laughs> Oh man! <laughs> so it allows you to be anybody. <laughs> no expectations from other people. You know, it's funny because again, like I said, I've been hanging out with my sister, and she's got a lot of really brilliant and witty, and I mean, these people sparkle. They're like they're writers, and they're smart, and they're funny, and every one of them should be the center of attention, you know? And when you're nobody, this is really especially true when I was a monk and I would come and hang out with my sister at some of her dinner parties when I had off. And everybody knew I was a monk, so I wasn't kind of a threat. And I'll tell you what, I could enjoy those people without judging them, without trying to compete with them. I could enjoy their brilliance and speak to them in ways that access that child in them that wanted to start writing or acting in the first place and see that part of them. When you're somebody, you gotta you gotta be somebody, and that's a big burden to carry around. It's a big, heavy burden. And you know what? Nobody cares if you're somebody. Nobody cares as much as you do. Like, you are the person that matters the most to 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 some 
to yourself when you're somebody. Nobody else really cares, but when you're allowed to, when you let go of that a little bit, you can give yourself to other people and you can make real connections and you feel love even from, from strangers. The selling points on being nobody, is, it's, a lo- it's a long list. I don't think there's a selling point on being somebody. It's just, <laughs> it's like a compulsion, you know, it's a, it's a compulsion and it's, and it's something that our culture sells us. Our culture needs us to strive to be somebody because we live in a highly materialistic culture. And it needs us to be striving to be somebody because that's what gets us out of bed and in, 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 into our striving jobs in the mornings and then keeps us shopping online all night. I mean, it keeps a, it keeps a consumer economy going if you always feel the sense of lack within yourself. Hmm. You need better clothes. You need better books. You need to watch, to sign up for Audible so that you can listen to the self-help audio books. You need to, you know, on and on and on, right? Who do you admire? I admire the nobodies. <laughs> the people that are genuine. It doesn't matter what you're doing. I mean, there's a lot, maybe there's a lot of, I mean, like my sister, for example, is a, she's, she's trying to become a writer, but I admire how she still has time for people. I admire people who are not selfish and can actually really listen to what you've said and offer something back that's helpful or interesting or useful. Selfless people. People that get a get a kick out of being selfless because because that's what when the interesting things happen in terms of relationships and culture and society. Hmm. I asked Natalie Goldberg this question and she really, really liked it. I asked Ooh. her, what do you no longer care about? Um, you you scared me a little bit with that Natalie Goldberg part. Now, why? I'm I'm now I'm feeling this should be my favorite question. No, <laughs> um, what I, <laughs> I began to care less and less about what people think, which is what everyone says, I guess. When you get when you get older, you start to care less about what people think. I began to care less about my my personal mission in life to be a famous writer or an enlightened monk. That is dropping away quickly. And that's nice. You just, you, you, again, like we, I was just saying, you hit a point where you realize the only person that cares about your success, that cares the most about your success is you, you know? Mm-hmm. And so if you can be infinitely happy with, with be, becoming somebody, then go ahead, go for it. But I, I care less and less about those things now and more about making connections with people and, and trying to do good work not worrying what other people think or about money or how I look or what people think about me. If I'm being a good boy, that's what I'm worried. I don't give a shit about anymore. (laughs) What is the greatest compliment that you've gotten? I mean, for example, when you heard that Leonard Cohen had these kind words to say about your book, the first book, did that have any weight? I mean, if, we, uh, yeah, I, I, I'd be a liar if I said it didn't have any weight because I really, really respect the guy. And it was helpful psychologically or psychically somehow to to be able to interact with him about writing. And not as though I could interact with him on, on his level. I mean, he's a he's a legend. He's a profound poet. But that we were sort of working on we had a similar project and that he got that and that he, he, he offered great advice here and there. Just, just talking about the writing process was was amazing. So I really appreciated that. And I, I, I I was happy that he got what I was trying to do, which was talk about what really happens in monasteries because he knows, I mean, he's seen it all. And and so that was, it was really nice to connect on that level. I mean, the most, the, the best compliments, that I get is just when someone will just express when I, when I, when I'm talking to someone, usually I don't, I don't meet that many people who really read my book, but sometimes I do, or, or they'll send me a message on Twitter or Facebook or something. And, and I can tell that something I wrote moved them in the same way that writers, I or move me. That's like, I can see that it moved them. That that's the greatest compliment. That that's what, that's why you do it to move people. Mm-hmm. Well, this is a very open-ended question. For anyone who's listening to this, 
just to kind of give you the stage, what would you say to them? That is pretty open. (laughs) It can't hurt to take five minutes a day out of your schedule, out of, out of your personal life, your professional life, your self improvement projects, your relaxation and your bad habits, whether it's whatever your bad habits are, your guilty pleasures. It can't hurt to just take just five minutes of maybe what we could call like sacred time. So I used to, I'm looking at the closet right now in my old apartment. I used to uh, meditate for just five minutes a day in, in my closet. I, I lived on Fountain Avenue, which is really busy. It's between Santa Monica and Sunset Boulevard. It's really busy and really noisy and always hot in the summer. So I'd go in the closet where it was cool and just kind of, I would take off my shoes outside and I would just sit down in a chair and taking off my shoes was like leaving my, my, all my, my, my projects and my burdens and my ambitions and my fears, all of that, leaving it outside the door and just sitting in silence with my breath, just being alive for just five minutes, just, just a person, just a being. Not not a guy with this ambition or that problem, but just a guy sitting in a chair breathing. I would call that sacred time. It, it can't hurt to find some way to bring sacred time into your life, however you define that. I mean, from mo- the most hardcore atheist to the most devout monotheist, you, you can find a way to step outside of your role and your personality and your time and place in this moment in history and, and just just manifest you, you know your 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 connection to something bigger and greater than yourself and just just the easiest way to do it is just to just to give your attention to your breath give your complete attention to the exhale and complete attention to the inhale something shifts when you do that try it out for a week you know and if and if you don't know if anything happened or if it was worth your time or anything. Try it again for another week. It, it's, it, it, it helps you cultivate a sense of, of, of freedom and not, not giving a damn about the things that are weighing you down so much and maybe weighing you down in, in ways you can't even imagine. It's so heavy and so omnipresent. You know, it's like a noise that's been in your ear since since you were born and maybe you can get a little bit of distance from that, that noise and, and, and experience kind of real peace. Well, I think I'm going to take your advice. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> In just a few minutes. Thank you very much for making the time to talk with us. Oh, it was absolutely my pleasure. I, I, it was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Again, the yeah. book is Single White Monk, Tales of Death, Failure, and Bad Sex. I think most of us have had experience with at least two of those, (laughs) although not necessarily in that order. And thank you again for joining us, and I hope our paths cross again. I hope so, too. Thank you, Paul. All right. Have a good one. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. For more information on Shozen Jack Hobner's book, Single White Monk, you can visit Shambhala Publications online at shambhala.com. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Paul Leslie Hour, and maybe it can help you in your life. If you haven't subscribed yet, I hope you consider doing so. Also, rating and reviewing us helps other people find this podcast. Always an honor to have you with us. Until next time. The Paul Leslie Hour is hosted, produced, and written by Paul Leslie for Lifestyles Entertainment. For information, visit thepaulleslie.com. Thank you for being with us. Until next time.